Hello, and welcome to the first Trinity Hall Entrepreneurship Lecture, The Impact Revolution. This evening's conversation will explore how impact is, or can be, a driver in every investment, business, consumption, and policy decision we make, and ask whether capitalism can be reshaped to drive real change. I'm Professor Jennifer Howard Grenville, the Diageo Professor in Organization Studies at the Cambridge Judge Business School and a fellow of Trinity Hall here at University of Cambridge. In my research and teaching over the years, I've been fascinated by how businesses can generate and navigate change related to sustainability. So I'm absolutely delighted with this opportunity to speak with our guest this evening, Sir Ronald Cohen. We'll be in conversation for about an hour and we welcome you to put your questions into the chat box. Ronnie is a true pioneer in impact investing, which involves directing capital and innovation to serve social and environmental good. He's played a pivotal role in, de in the development of this sector, founding cornerstone institutions like Big Society Capital and Social Finance, UK, USA, and Israel. More recently, he's been working with the Impact Weighted Accounts Project at the Harvard Business School to drive the creation of financial accounts that transparently capture a company's true financial, social, and environmental impacts. Last year, he also published his third book, Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change, which we'll hear more about in a moment. This evening's event is a partnership between two organizations that I am enormously proud to be a part of. Trinity Hall, one of the oldest colleges at the University of Cambridge, and the Cambridge Center for Social Innovation, one of the newest centers at the Cambridge Judge Business School. With the generous support of alumnus and honorary fellow, Graham Ross Russell, the college and the center are working together to build a community of practice around social innovation and entrepreneurship. Together, we award the annual Cambridge Social Innovation Prize, celebrating outstanding founder CEOs of successful, scalable social enterprises with a proven record of impact. Through events like this, we hope to inspire others to consider how they too can create impact in their life and work. Ronnie, thank you very much for joining us. Your latest book, Impact, explores the idea of the impact revolution and calls on all of us to change how we do business, starting with where and how we invest our money. So first, let's begin by asking, why do we need an impact revolution now? And what are some of the key elements of it? Thank you, Jen. Thank you for your kind introduction. It's wonderful to be here with you and uh, with uh, the Cambridge community. Uh, and in, in particular, I want to remember Paul Judd, who was a, a good friend of mine, uh, and also uh, Sir Harvey McGrath and Graham Ross Russell, both of whom are involved with the two organizations that have uh, organized this uh, meeting. So it's a, it's a special pleasure for me to be here with all of you. Now, to answer your question, Jen, uh, I, I'd simply say that we're all aware that we can't continue uh, in the way we're doing. Uh, it's obvious to us all, uh, you know, in this virtual meeting uh, that uh, we can't cope with the environmental and social challenges we face. Mm -hmm. And the reason is our system has become self-defeating. Uh, since uh, before the Industrial Revolution, capitalism has pulled the billions of uh, people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. But in the early days, of uh, our industrial development uh, and into the middle of uh, the last uh, century, governments could cope relatively well with the consequences, environmental and social, uh, of, uh, of, of the system, of uh, the pollution and the social issues uh, that were created or aggravated by businesses. Today, after globalization, the scale of this damage is too big, even for governments to handle. And so the question arises, well, how do we cope with these challenges? And many have diagnosed the, the challenges 
And there have been very few proposals for how we can actually cope with it. Mm -hmm. Some proposals have had to do with redistribution of income and general agreements about the environment. But we've seen in the latter case over four decades that these haven't led to anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think we must realize that the problem lies within our system and that we need to shift our system to the next frontier for capitalism, which is for companies and for investors to strive not just to make profit while ignoring the damage they cause, but to make profit while helping solve the big social and environmental problems we face. Great. So you talk in the book about something, um, you know, drawing the analogy with the fact that we actually didn't really measure and quantify risk until quite recently. And so the notion of risk return and its opportunity for people to therefore um, invest in a portfolio of, of, uh, of investments that have different levels of risk associated with them um, sort of revolutionized how investment occurred in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, and you talk about the triple helix now of thinking around risk return and impact. Maybe you can unpack that a little bit and explain to us how you see this revolution moving from one that developed, as you say, um, higher risk opportunities like venture capital, let's fund innovation, to the opportunities that we now need to pursue? A wonderful question, Jen. And I want to relate it to my own uh, life and career, if I may, because I think it'll, uh, you know, it'll help explain what's going on now. So when I discovered venture capital in the mid-60s, when I was uh, at business school uh, in the United uh, States at uh, Harvard, um, it was the result of a paradigm shift in investment mm -hmm. thinking. Up until uh, the early uh, 60s, a typical pension fund or insurance company's portfolio would consist of the stocks and uh, the, the shares uh, and bonds uh, of the country of the investor. When the concept of risk measurement was developed at the University of Chicago in the early 50s and academics began to realize that while risk had always been there, we'd never been able to measure it. And why not look back at how volatile investments had been over long periods of time and extrapolate from that their future volatility? When that happened, it wasn't just a breakthrough in, in, in thinking. It had huge implications for portfolios. And portfolios shifted from stocks and, and, and bonds of national uh, uh, investors to the multi-asset class portfolios that we see today. Mm -hmm. And it is that which opened the door to venture capital which in turn funded the tech revolution. Yeah. And it also opened the door to investment in emerging markets and funded globalization. Mm -hmm. And so the concept of, of uh, risk-adjusted returns brought the concept of diversification and the investors use these concepts to improve their investment performance. Mm -hmm. Now, what is happening now gives me a sense of déjà vu. Mm. Because we see breakthroughs now because of uh, technology, computing power, the storage of, uh, of uh, big um, uh, data and, and uh, so on, that we are able to measure the impact of companies, something we've never been able to do in, in, you know, in human history. So we can now measure the impact that the company makes through its operations on the environment and turn it into monetary terms. We can do the same about the impact companies create through their employment mm -hmm. and the impacts which companies create on people and the environment uh, through their products. That measurement will, in my view, have the same implications as 
the measurement of risk to be. Because when we begin to measure the impacts of companies, we begin to look at them in a very different way. It's eye-opening. If you look at the data at the Harvard Business School, the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative to which you uh, referred, mm -hmm. uh, we've already posted the environmental damage caused by 1,800 public uh, companies across the world. Now, if I say to you, Jen, that 250 of these companies create more damage than profit in a year, that a third of them, more than 600 actually, create damage equivalent to 25% or more of their profit, and that together the 1800 create three trillion dollars worth of environmental damage in a year. Doesn't it bring a new perspective on all of the discussion that uh, we're having about environmental uh, and climate change? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's fantastic because if we don't grapple with what these quantities and measures and impacts actually are, we'll never be able to price them into the system. Um, one of the things that puzzles me though, is that if you think about risk, risk was always there, we just didn't have a good way of measuring it. Um, environmental and social damage is always there, we haven't had a good way of measuring it. But when I want to invest, there's a room in my portfolio for low risk, medium risk and high risk there's really going to be no room in anyone's portfolio for low impact. So once we start to measure impact, what will that look like in terms of reshaping the market? Because the ripple effects you described were very real. Once high risk became an attractive way to invest as part of a portfolio, that unleashed innovation. Once low impact becomes unattractive, what then happens? Are all investors going to move in the way that we want them to? Are there going to be um, divergences within the market? What's your prediction? Well, I think what's going to happen is that investors will direct their money away from companies that refuse to take impact into account. So if you take a company like ExxonMobil, which in, in, in my book, uh, Impact, uh, you, you have seen, creates $39 billion of environmental damage a year from its operations alone without taking into account the oil that takes out of the ground. And the management of ExxonMobil says, uh, we believe in fossil fuels and we're not going to go into clean energy. And its competitors, Shell, uh, which is a bigger company, creates 23 billion of damage a year, and BP creates 10 uh, billion uh, or so, and both are going in the direction of clean energy. Mm. You'll see investors shifting. And indeed, the price of ExxonMobil has, uh, has fallen like a stone on the stock market. The market capitalization of the company has fallen from 500 billion three years ago to 130 billion today. At the same time, if you look at companies like Tesla, which have pushed hard on the clean energy pedal, if I can put it that way, the stock price of uh, Tesla uh, multiplied by seven times in the last year alone. And so the weight of the $40 trillion of ESG uh, investment money in the market today is tilting the valuations of, of companies, um, shifting downwards those that pollute more or create social issues and raising those that have a better performance in that respect. And indeed, in the Harvard data, you can already see these correlations between high environmental damage and lower stock market valuations relative to competitors. And it has very uh, important implications for our financial markets mm -hmm. because in, in, in regulators can't ignore the fact that there's now 
price sensitive information in the form of impact data, which is accessed only by a small number of people who know about the Harvard Business School uh, uh, initiative. And so regulators will have to step in. I believe they will step in within the next three to five years, no, no further than that. And mandate that companies must publish audited impact weighted accounts that take into consideration the environmental and the social impacts that companies create, positive and, and negative. So, so this is interesting because you're, you're articulating some of the ways in which the impact revolution might actually have to look somewhat different from the you know, risk revolution, if we want to call it that, in the sense that essentially by, by measuring risk, we could allow you know, what's often called the invisible hand of the market to take care of it. Um, but we're going to need transparency. We're going to need governments to step in and require disclosure. And indeed, disclosure can be incredibly powerful. Um, the toxic releases inventory, which is um, data released uh, about the toxic chemical emissions um, of US facilities. Um, this is an old story, but in the 1980s, following the Union Carbide disaster in Bhopal, India, um, companies were required to disclose publicly um, what they emitted to air, land, water um, from their facilities. Within two years, the 7 billion pounds of toxic releases had been reduced by 20% without any further government action, simply the act of disclosure. So, um, so I, I get it, um, you know, we're absolutely going to need to have some requirements, some standards, and, and like you said, some robust ways of measuring these things. Um, a question from me, and I think it's related to some of the questions starting to come in from the chat, so keep feeding those in, please, and we'll get to those. But um, this then relies on incredibly good measures, measures that people can trust, measures that we know are measure, measuring the right things. Um, and going back to the chemical releases, it's fantastic. Seven billion pounds of toxic releases is seven billion pounds of bad. But how bad is it? Um, that's a you know, that's a quantity, but it says nothing about the sort of human health or ecological health impacts. A lot depends on where it's released to, you know, is it groundwater, is it air, et cetera. And we have very sophisticated ways of assessing those. But when we come to social and environmental measurements, what is your hope? What is your, what is your sort of realistic expectation about how well we can actually measure these things to get the right data into the hands of people who need it? Well, when we kicked off the, the Harvard effort um, a couple of years ago, um, we did not expect to make, at least I did not expect to make as quick progress as we have made in bringing granular information about the impacts of companies. It turns out uh, that these 1800 companies disclosed publicly their environmental the impact of their environmental footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, if that information is available, and if organizations like SASB and, and others have uh, put, uh, put it uh, together into uh, metrics uh, that can be accessed by every user, then what is left is really the need to pick uh, and choose among these metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, and having decided which ones are the most reliable, create a pathway to monetizing them. And there's a ton of science around now in the environmental area about the cost of a ton of CO2, for, for instance, but also about other emissions uh, gen. So actually, it is totally feasible to measure the environmental impact of a company. And then when we started to work on the employment impact and started to define what that meant and break it down into diversity, comparing the diversity within a company to the diversity around its facilities, ascribing remuneration levels to the missing people from excluded minorities at every level of the organization, we began to monetize that and to monetize 
unequal pay and uh, gender inequality and advancement inequality. And so we're able to look at a company like Apple, measure all of these different elements and say, you know, it has a $10 billion uh, salary bill a year, roughly, in the US, but there's $2.7 billion negative charge for lack of diversity against that. And if you compare it with Costco, which is much more diverse and employs twice as many people, 160,000, look at Costco's performance. The charge is a billion dollars instead of $2.7 billion. Yes. And we're now measuring the product impacts of companies. And we look sector by sector and we define the criteria for measuring them. So in the car industry, it's how long the car lasts, how many miles you can drive it, how much maintenance uh, cost you're going to incur, how many accidents and recalls it has. And you can measure all of these things and cost them. So I'm going into some detail in answering your very important question, because I think it's important that everyone participating with us in this discussion today realizes that we're on the threshold of this being reality. Mm -hmm. If uh, regulators and IOSCO, which is the international organization that brings all of the world's regulators together, has identified the need uh, for uh, regulation around sustainability and is considering uh, what form that regulation should uh, take. Uh, if regulators within the next uh, two or three years uh, uh, stipulate that we have to, as companies, to publish impact-weighted accounts, they will be published just a couple of years after that. So that's fantastic. And also on the progress that is being made around measuring social impact, which is just so much more difficult, for example, than measuring carbon emissions. Um, so some of the questions coming in from the chat are a bit more challenging in the, que in the sense that can we actually expect um, what we sometimes call win-win opportunities here? Um, so does the system that uh, rewards profitability and rewards profit making actually have the capacity to address um, multiple social and environmental ills? And in specifically, some people are asking, um, what about the gap between the rich and the poor? What about the gap on CEO salaries versus average employee salaries? Um, is there a limit? Do you see a limit to what kinds of issues big companies are, are willing to tackle and governments are willing to force them to tackle? And then I think we want to also think about small companies because they're not going to be subject to these kinds of um, same types of incentives. Okay, well, uh, let's tackle each of um, these questions in turn. I mean, on, on the first uh, one, uh, what uh, is it uh, that we can expect that this change of, uh, of accounting, if you like, shifting to impact uh, accounting uh, and, and having uh, the numbers incorporated in financial accounts? Uh, what could we expect that to do for the behavior of companies? Well, to the extent that there's now a change of values, which says consumers are more likely to buy your product if you have uh, values that prevent pollution and child labor, employment of child uh, labor, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, if it's uh, easier for you to attract the talent, if uh, your values are consonant in a similar way. If investors uh, are more likely to invest in you, you're effectively making it much easier for companies that strive to achieve impact and profit at the same time to be successful than companies that strive to optimize just risk and return. So there's a, an element today of industries opening up to new entrants who can achieve profit and impact in the way that Tesla 
is you know is is doing and disrupt the health sector in the same way that technology did previously. So I do believe, as and you've given a very good example of it, that given the change in values, as this information about impact begins to flow very widely through our financial system. Companies will get categorized into impact positive companies and impact negative companies. And investors will then begin to look at the second part of your question, which is, what is this company's impact in the area that interests me most? If I'm environmentally conscious, I don't want to invest in a polluting company. But if I'm also socially conscious, then I want to invest in a company whose performance in terms of diversity and lack of discrimination uh, 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 and so on is also good. And so when you talk in terms of gaps in, in uh, pay, um, obviously the economic system uh, can't resolve all of the inequalities that exist in our society. Uh, governments have to play their role. They have to redistribute uh, wealth and, and, and income, um, and they use uh, taxation to, um, to do this. But if businesses are held to a high standard, if they have to pay a living wage, if they want to be able to raise money and attract talent and, and, and consumers, if they have to treat minorities in, in, in an equal way and women and men in an equal way, then we will see their behavior improve quite, you know, quite uh, simply. Mm. And now to the third part of, of, of the question, just as with financial accounting, and I think sometimes, Jen, uh, when people begin to think about impact accounting, uh, they want to hold it to an even higher standard than financial accounting. Like there are plenty of issues in financial accounting, as you well know, uh, which aren't cut and dried. Uh, the recognition of income for a software company is still a big bone of contention. And the accounting rules uh, around financial accounts are changing every month with major implications for balance sheets and, and profitability. The same is going to be true of impact. Uh, the important thing is going to be for us uh, to take the first step and then to improve. And where small and uh, medium-sized businesses are concerned, we will need a simplified form of impact accounting, just as we have a simplified form or at least of impact uh, reporting uh, within accounts, uh, just as we do with their financial accounts. So um, thank you for, for clarifying that. And I think, um, you know, certainly producing the incentives um, and allowing people to, to have the information that allows them to, to make informed decisions is, is a crucial part of it. Um, one question has come in that asks, and I think it's, it's relevant actually, as, as you cited earlier, um, the inflows, for example, to ESG funds have been phenomenal between April and June of last year at the heart of the lockdowns, they exceeded annual flows prior. Now that you could also point to negative oil prices around the same time and say, you know, there were a large number of large companies, tech companies that were doing well and doing good. So to what extent does um, an emphasis on impact investing um, through the regular channels actually potentially, and this is a question from the chat, potentially harm um, flows that might otherwise go into, into smaller companies, into sectors, like you said, that tackle fundamental inequality. Because basically if big business can serve our needs as being both profitable and have positive in impact, we need to look no further. We need to ask no more. Look, uh, disruption opens the door to competition from smaller, more innovative uh, companies. Uh, that's what we saw with the tech revolution. That's how I made my career as a venture capitalist. Um, if this disruption uh, is going to be as big as the tech revolution, which I believe it's going to open the door for massive investment uh, into small and medium-sized uh, businesses. And I think the ESG flows uh, are extremely significant, not um, just because they're so huge, 
but because they express a deep feeling within the investor community uh, that we cannot continue to look just as the profit of companies because values have changed. If as an investor, you only want to invest on the basis of the profit a company makes and you ignore the impacts it's creating, you're going to ignore the plummeting value of your coal reserves, the plummeting value of, of oil. Uh, oil isn't going to be a rising commodity now. The more clean energy comes in, the less oil level uh, oil prices are going to be are going to be high mm -hmm. and so the fact that 40 trillion dollars worth of investors money is seeking to achieve more than profit gives us the opportunity to improve the world massively the sdgs uh we all i would imagine on this uh webinar want to achieve the SDGs. There's a $30 trillion gap now between what's needed to achieve them by 2030 and what's available. Where's it going to come from? It can only come from investment markets. Well, if you begin to measure the product impact on vulnerable populations and it becomes a consideration for investors, more money is going to go to companies that are going to be serving vulnerable populations in developed and emerging countries alike. You really will provide a different set of incentives. And so this link between, if you like, uh, ethics, ethics and our economic system is going to drive capital flows to those in our society who have typically been deprived of them. So let's think, I mean, we've been talking a lot about investment flows and there's more questions coming in, in, in but your book deals with many other um, pieces of the puzzle. And so we've talked about the important role of governments in setting standards um, and holding companies, large companies to these types of standards. We've talked about innovation, but not really specifically, um, but there's also um, philanthropy there. Um, there are a you know, number of people on the call will be interested in um, social enterprise and entrepreneurship itself. And how do all of these things fit together? Because fundamentally we're talking about capitalism, fixing capitalism, capitalism, reinventing a new form of capitalism. Um, are we simply chasing our tail in terms of putting more money after the ills that we've created collectively? Or are there different ways that we can imagine the learning, not just the investment flows, um, to enable addressing, as you said, some of the social impacts that are occurring around the world um, that may or may not even be on the radar screen of the large companies that we've been talking about? Well, what, what uh, you've seen in the book, Jen, <clears throat> is that uh, I believe and I wrote a chapter about each of, of these groups, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, impact thinking has uh, major implications uh, for the business models of entrepreneurs and the big businesses and uh, the investment strategies of investors, that it has major uh, implications for philanthropy uh, and also for governments. So in, in that sense, uh, like technology, which uh, has created the water on which every ship must sail, uh, impact is going to create another layer of water on top of technology on which every ship will have to sail uh, as well. Now, what do these implications amount to? In the case of entrepreneurs, they amount to young people in creating their ventures, seeking to achieve impact and profit and developing a business model that delivers both at the same time and enables them to grow faster and more profitably mm -hmm. in the way that, you know, today we would say a, a Tesla has done. For big businesses, uh, it means competing on the basis 
of products that deliver better value, uh, that serve uh, vulnerable communities as well as, as, as the well-off. Because if you're a pharmaceutical firm that comes up with a revolutionary treatment for cancer that costs $300,000 uh, to administer, your impact's going to be deep but extremely narrow, like a needle. If, on the other hand, you come up with a cancer treatment uh, that costs uh, just a few thousand dollars and can be used across uh, the world, uh, your impact is going to be massive in comparison. So it's going to affect the product strategies of companies. It's going to affect their employment practices. It's going to affect their logistics operations. Already we see big companies like Walmart and others shifting to electric um, vehicles. We will see more and more and more of, uh, of, of that happening through the manufacturing and logistics of, uh, of, uh, of companies. And then when it comes to philanthropy, our philanthropic model has been based on giving donations. And that model has led to every charitable organization almost in the world having two characteristics in common being small and out of money. Why? Because we don't measure anything and because we can't bring investments. Mm -hmm. And if you begin to measure, as a social impact bond showed, you can attract investment on the basis of achieving a social improvement. So all of a sudden, a social, entrepreneurs running, uh, a social entrepreneur running a charitable organization to help the homeless can ask uh, themselves the question, how many people do I want to serve? If I can show that I'm more effective than others in taking the homeless off the street and into jobs, I can raise money like a business. I can raise a $5 million social impact bond or pounds, and then a 10 million pound one, and then a 20 million pound one, and so on. How many do I want to help? I may be helping seven or 10,000 today, and, and there may be 100,000 or 300,000 homeless people in the world, and it's going to be uh, in, in the UK, say, it's going to be aggravated by the COVID crisis. And then can philanthropy really continue to focus on activities and funding activities rather than the outcomes achieved? Shouldn't philanthropy be funding outcomes funds, as I describe in the book, that pay when the improvement in educational attainment or the prevention of people from getting from pre-diabetic to being diabetic has actually been achieved and attract investment money opposite with its uh, discipline, its open-mindedness with regard to the risk of, uh, in, of innovation and so on and, uh, and so forth. And finally, yes. uh, can we really concentrate as philanthropists with big foundations and big endowments in giving away 5% a year while 95% invest in fossil fuel companies and companies that use child labor and so on and so forth? Or shouldn't our endowments and our grant programs both achieve the mission of our charity? And when it comes to government, finally, Jen, government has also focused on activities rather than on outcomes. Shouldn't we be budgeting according to the outcomes that we want to achieve? And again, um, use, use pay for success mechanisms uh, that enable us to create competition from small businesses against, you know, competing against uh, big ones to see who can deliver the best uh, social outcomes. So I think the implications of this new impact thinking are a paradigm shift throughout all of our activities. So thank you for unpacking the role of each of those. And as you say, there's a chapter in the book that deals with each um, and they all have a role to play, obviously. I suppose coming at this as an organizational scholar, um, I tend to think about things like, um, like transaction costs or coordination costs, um, the actual sort of difficulty of getting entities together to trust each other, to work together. Um, and also to some degree, the question, and I think it's coming in from many in the audience about is big always better. Um, so if we move everything into a mode 
where we can measure impact and where we reward impact and we do that at scale, um, not only might we miss certain forms of impact, we might miss certain forms of knowledge or learning or development that's extremely important and maybe even more successful, not scalable. So I'm thinking about in the social investment bond um, examples that you share in the book, you know, 17 foundations needing to come together to deliver the investment, um, the government needing to be a, a real partner in developing what this even looks like, what are the metrics? Um, can we do that? Should we be doing that? Um, just because we can attract an inflow of capital to fund these kinds of things, what are the other bits, the non-financial bits um, okay. that might get in the way? So Jen, um, let's compare uh, two things. Let's assume we want to improve the, the education of 10 million children in Africa and the Middle East. Our traditional way of doing it would be to put another billion dollars of aid to give aid to governments or to NGOs. The new way of thinking is we would get the donors, the official aid organizations, the philanthropists, and the local governments to make commitments to a billion dollar outcomes fund. That outcomes fund would sign, sign contracts with NGOs and businesses that can innovate in improving the attainment levels at school of 10 million children across, across the whole continent. As it signs its contracts with each one of these delivery organizations, be they charitable or a profit with purpose business, it gives them the power to turn to a Development Impact Bond Fund for Education, set up by Bridges Ventures and, and, and Credit Suisse, and say, look, I have a more imaginative, innovative way of helping 300,000 children in northern Ghana to improve their attainment levels at school. If I achieve the numbers in the contract, I will get paid $30 million. I need $22 million in order to do that work. And I will give you a return of between 4 and 10%. Well, zero and 10%, but your expectation might be uh, that it's going to be somewhere between 4 and 8% uh, on your money, and you will be helping with that money to improve the education of 10 million children. Which is more likely to succeed? The answer to your question is if you really want to get serious about improving people's lives, let's not stick with ways of doing it that just don't work as effectively as they should. Similarly, if you want to improve billions of people's economic lives, you have to change the way in which our economies work. You can't do it by tinkering within our economies. And every few decades and sometimes centuries, you get ideas which shift us to a new frontier, mm -hmm. enable us to do things that we've previously been unable to do. Economic systems change, as you know, Jen. We had mercantilism. Countries strived to accumulate as much gold as they could, because that was a sign of wealth. And then we came to capitalism yeah. and we had the laissez-faire and then we got to managed economies and, and, and welfare states. And then we had a throwback to the Milton Friedman era uh, to complete laissez-faire, let companies get on with just making money and worrying about nothing else. And now we're at a new frontier. So that's really helpful. And the Africa example really unpacks this difference between um, it may be possible to leverage capital at scale, yet actually create delivery that is local and specialized and um, delivered through a number of delivery partners. I still worry that the transaction costs will be very high, but I think you're absolutely right. Our traditional um, aid models have very high transaction costs within them too. Um, I am reminded of uh, some work that um, my colleagues Johanna Mayer and Christian Silos have done on 
uh, social innovation. And their work is quite intriguing because they argue that in certain areas, actually, we don't really need innovation. So we might be able to deliver education using some very tried and true boring old methods. Um, yet, in, in, in all forms, um, often efforts that are apparently socially innovative with a capital I um, tend to attract the support, whether it be through grants or other forms of funding. Um, they actually argue that it can be dangerous when people are living vulnerable lives. The last thing we want to do is, you know, fail often as they do in Silicon Valley. So do you think that there's a limit to this? So I, I totally get that we can leverage capital at scale for social problems. Should we force people to innovate? I, I believe in social progress. Uh, the way I got into impact investment is because I was asked to look by the British Treasury in 2000, when I was still running APAC, at the issue of poverty and why we haven't made more progress in solving it. And the answer we can see today is because our system aggravates the social issues we have, because searching for profit only is no longer a sustainable way uh, for our economies to progress. We need to shift them in the direction of government's objectives. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, we can see what's happening. We're having floods, we're having fires, we're having migration as a result of them. We have rebellion in the streets, in places as far flung as France and Chile and the Lebanon and the United States. Mm -hmm. We can see the evidence. I mentioned in the book, that at the 30th anniversary of Apex Partners, the firm I co-founded, in 2002, I made a speech where I said, if we don't deal with those who are left behind in our society, a curtain of fire will come to separate the rich from the poor in our cities, in our countries, and, and across continents. And it's happening before our eyes. Now, the impetus for me in setting off on this road was to find ways of improving the lives of the most vulnerable. And I started off with philanthropy and we invented the social impact bond in order to bring investment capital, which is far more plentiful than 200 to $300 trillion of investment capital and one and a half trillion of, uh, of philanthropic capital in the world to bring investment capital to tackle social issues. In the process, I realized that our invention was actually a symptom of what was happening in the world, that optimizing risk, return, and impact within a social impact bond, where your financial return depends on the social improvement, was actually what was happening, where young people were refusing to buy certain products. And as a result of that, investors, and because talent wouldn't go to these companies that were manufacturing, um, manufacturing products, but uh, uh, in, in ways that were unacceptable, that investors became aware that these changes were occurring and they too began to go in the same direction. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have our capital flows now measuring impact, that 40 trillion of ESG will become like the trillion of impact investment, which by the way, is already as big as the world's venture capital pool. And the distinction between the two is the measurement of impact which is the case with impact investment, but not ESG. But if we begin to measure the impact of ESG, we turn it all into impact investment. Now, if investment flows change the behavior of companies, our whole economic system begins to deliver solutions rather than create and aggravate social and environmental problems, Grant. And so, sure, there are going to be unintended consequences along the way, which we're going to have to cope with. Uh, and as these transitions uh, happen, uh, you have to adjust. But that's how the world has progressed. Our economic system is changing before our eyes. Uh, 
you can either look at it, analyze it, and realize it, or you can ignore it. But if you ignore it, and you're a business person, or you're an employee, a talented employee of a fossil fuel company, you're going to end up paying for it, just as happened with technology. Yeah. If you ignored, as a retailer, the impact that technology would have on you, well, we know what happened. Mm -hmm. If you ignored, as a co-company, the impact the climate movement would have on your fortune, well, you wrote off a huge portion of your balance sheet. So here's a question, uh, and a number of people have asked this in the in the chat. Um, we're getting back to the challenges of measurement because there's a timing issue. Many of the things, so yes, we are well apprised on climate change and we know what we have to do and we know the time frame upon which we have to do it. And even attributing those impacts to individual companies is relatively straightforward actually compared to some things like habitat loss, biodiversity, impact of toxic chemicals, impact of plastics. Um, so how do we, how can we deal with the fact that some things are inherently difficult to measure and that the measurements themselves might not come to bear, that the, the actual outcomes and impacts might not come to bear until it's too late to create the incentive within the system to act on that. Is that something that you've that, that worries you. So I would disagree that uh, measuring plastic uh, pollution is a difficult thing to them. It's not. Uh, like carbon pollution, uh, you are able to measure uh, the tons of plastic that go into into a company and go out in packaging, you know, on, on the other side. That that is uh, just not the case. When you get into diversity, up until now, we haven't had a way of doing it, but I've explained to you how we're doing it in the Harvard Business School um, effort. Uh, by all means, uh, read the report about it. You're probably going to see a few thousand companies' employment impact emerge in the next three months or so. Uh, let's use your expertise to improve it. Um, there will be issues just as they were with financial accounts. Uh, but there's no doubt at all that if investors begin to worry about the level of diversity of companies or the environmental damage they're causing and begin to rebel as happened at the Procter & Gamble meeting just a month ago, where two thirds of shareholders voted against management because of the deforestation management was causing through its use of palm oil. Mm -hmm. We've never seen that before. And you're gonna see it, mark my words, around diversity. Mm -hmm. You're so going to see it. Yeah, diversity is an interesting one though, right? Because we can measure it, um, but are we measuring the impact? So we can measure the, the number of individuals from various backgrounds who participate in decision-making, but are we measuring better decision-making? Are we measuring right. greater inclusion? It's uh, it's very hard to put numbers on some of these things. I'm also aware that that we have, um, that we're running up to the hour. So I'll let you, I'll let you speak to that, but I do want to sneak in um, a question that is relevant to the pandemic. Uh, I think it would be remiss uh, not I, to. I think your question is the way we move forward from frontier to frontier. When microfinance was invented and it's grown to be a $130 billion sector, mm -hmm. it was immediately assumed that if you give employment to people who otherwise would be unemployed, uh, it must be a good thing. And then as Seduflo and others began to look at it in detail and said, wait a minute, it's not obvious that they're not just borrowing again to repay the original borrowing. Uh, that the stress level of, uh, when I, I don't want to put that into Esther Duflo's mouth, but people have worried that the stress levels that go with taking on these borrowings, the pressures, because as you know, uh, five people in the community would guarantee the debt, the pressures are very hard for the family to bear. Yeah. Nevertheless, uh, 
you, you've found the mechanism now to provide employment, and now you have to worry about the impact, not just the output, uh, which is you know, people actually being in jobs, but what is the impact on their lives? Are they eating better? Is their health better? Are they able to leave their kids at school instead of pulling them out of school? That's the, the impact. And so it's a process of, uh, of iteration, trying things, improving them, and moving forward. There will definitely be problems in the way of shifting our economies. Mm -hmm. But are they as great as the problems we face with our economies today? No. People ask us to prove that the ways of educating people that we're advocating work better than the existing system. But can they prove that the existing system is working? No, it's abject failure. So, you know, like technology, half of the people won't believe in it and half of the people will, and time will, time will tell. So that's fantastic because I think that's an area where I can violently agree with you, the, um, the importance of learning and improvement. So um, measurements will be imperfect, we know that. Um, we've already got a number that are imperfect and if we don't le lead ourselves to believe in them blindly um, and we continue to ask the questions of what they're actually producing and can produce and refine them, um, then I think we are moving in the direction that you have laid out um, so well in the book. Um, we have just a moment or two, and so I would love a thought from you on um, is recovering from the pandemic going to make this harder or easier for all of the entities that you've alerted us to that need to be involved in the impact revolution? So, Jen, I think COVID will accelerate the change just as it's accelerated remote working and shaken other habits and, and beliefs that we've held for a long period of time. I believe we're at a similar crossroads to uh, the early 30s, that uh, the crash of 29, which brought transparency on the profit of companies through gap accounting and auditors, uh, is similar uh, to the crossroad we're at today, where the COVID-19 crash um, is making us aware that we're investing in companies and we understand the profit they make, but we don't understand the impact they have, and we're looking for, and we're looking for impact. I think governments are going to emerge from this crisis with hugely magnified social issues and environmental problems that have continued to mount because we've taken no action, and they're going to realize that they don't have the means to cope with these challenges. And that the only way to do so is to bring business and investment alongside them to bring solutions. And that you can't do that simply by changing taxation and mm -hmm. providing incentives. You really have to do that by measuring the impact and then shifting taxation to tax those directly mm -hmm. who are creating the damage rather than the system we have today, which is very unfair, where we tax everyone in order to remedy the damage caused by some. Yeah. In short, uh, I think we are living through an acceleration of this transition uh, and that the, the huge interest in ESG has in part to do with the heightened awareness uh, about social and environmental issues which uh, COVID uh, yeah. has created. Thank you. That sounds like a great place to end. Um, and with the optimism that what we've all seen in the last year and more months to come um, will actually accelerate this transition. So Ronnie, thank you so much for the conversation today. It's been a real pleasure um, to learn from you, to, um, to, to discuss some of these important ideas that you're raising. Um, there's lots of other questions in the chat that were raised by people. I know if you'd like to learn more, those of you in the audience, um, please do read Ronnie's book. Um, it's fascinating and there's lots and lots of examples and cases and arguments that I haven't had the time to discuss with him today. Um, please know that this event will also be published online and we'll make sure that we share the link with everybody who's attended today. 
Um, and if this conversation leaves you inspired, which we hope it does, there are many, many ways to get involved with social innovation and social entrepreneurship um, through uh, the organizations that have hosted this event today, um, both Trinity Hall and the Cambridge Center for Social Innovation. Um, many of these are actually open to anyone, not just students and alumni. So there are public lectures like today's event. Um, thank you again for the first inaugural and um, we're looking forward to many more. Um, there are also opportunities to host students um, as volunteers or interns, um, direct support for emerging entrepreneurs to develop new business ideas. And as we mentioned the, earlier, the Cambridge Social Innovation Prize, which um, will be awarded annually to four outstanding leaders of social enterprises. Um, thank you again, Ronnie. Thank you again to our donor, Graham Ross Russell and his family for their ongoing support of the Trinity Hall um, Entrepreneurship Network and for making this event possible this evening. I hope you've had um, an inspiring time listening. Thank you very much, Jen. Great pleasure to chat uh, with you and uh, look forward to working with all of you uh, to make uh, impact happen. Absolutely. Thank you, Ronnie.